There we go. Now we're finally live. All right. Good morning, you guys. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to my Tuesday Q and A. Um, if you are new here, we have about like 75 new members in the past week. So if you are new here, welcome. Um, I am Allison Ellis of realflowerbusiness.com. And today I have a very special guest for our Tuesday Q&A. Um, if you are, again, if you're new here, I do this every Tuesday. Usually it's just me kind of answering your questions. But every now and again, I'm very lucky to have a special guest. And today I have Michelle Loretta of Sage Wedding Pros. If by any chance you're not familiar with Michelle, I shared a little of her bio, but you should be familiar with Michelle, okay? I, um, I was writing to her yesterday. I can't kind of even remember a time where I wasn't familiar with Sage Wedding Pros. And that's because a good friend of mine who talks business with me said, you know, oh, do you follow Sage Wedding Pros? And th that was it. It was like, oh, obviously you need to follow this person. So if you don't know Michelle, she is a financial strategy person. She understands stuff that most of us creative business owners really want to avoid. OK, <laughs> she's not afraid to dive into the numbers and she understands them and she explains them really well. So she has been an accountant. She's been a merchandiser for coach. She had her own stationary business. So she has done this work on the scale that we have where you know that one on one client interaction. And now she actually produces her own conferences. So she's spoken at conferences. That's where I first got to see her in real life was at a chapel designer conference many years ago. Um, maybe not many years ago. Maybe that it's found, that's a little extreme. At least five years ago. <laughs> and when I, when I saw that she was doing her um, B Sage conference, I wanted to go. And so I, she's one of the conferences that I have personally invested in and gone to because she talks about the business stuff and it was a great conference. So um, I definitely highly recommend all her stuff. She's also got online classes, you guys. So don't like, if you are liking what she's saying today, we're gonna talk about cash flow. If you need more of that, you can get that right on her website, okay? So sageweddingpros.com. If you just go into the Google and write Sage Wedding, it's gonna feed you up, Sage Wedding Pros, because. In the, in the results. So yeah, she's been teaching and helping entrepreneurs for like o over 10 years, 11 year anniversary I saw on her Instagram, she just celebrated. So um, she's the real deal and I'm gonna bring her in now. Um, hi guys, I see you tuning in. Thanks for being here. All right, and I'm gonna bring in Michelle. Hey Michelle. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is so fun. Thank you so much for doing this. I so appreciate it because you are, I was just saying to Michelle, um, like, I think she's a huge get, you guys. I think having her here <laughs> is a really, really big deal because she understands the stuff that most of us work really hard to avoid. Um, <laughs> right? And, you know, I was saying, like, I first saw you in real life at the Chapel Designer Conference in New York years, a few years ago. And you changed my life. I have emailed you this a couple of times. You're probably like <laughs> emailing me the same story over again. But she did this really great presentation about your core values. And for years I had been kind of struggling at that point where you know you're better than you seem, you know, you're like, yeah. I'm better than I look online and I'm better than um, than that first glance. I'm better than my bio, you know? And I was trying to build giving into my mission, like I was donating to the food bank, but nobody cared, it was the truth. And then <laughs> I saw you give a really great, concise presentation and it was interactive, of course, because she's always like, you you got to, she's, she and I are like that. You got to do work. We want you yeah. to get something started. <laughs> and, and that's something I definitely have picked up from you. So getting started on your core values, what are they? Why are they? But then the biggest key that she unlocked for me was you have to put them in front of people, right? So it's not enough to just have the core values or want to have a mission of giving back. You have to then show your customers 
And she did some great examples of how you do that. And um, it absolutely changed my business. Once I started putting my core values in front of people, instead of just like thinking maybe they'll see it on my website. Mm -hmm. I knew they weren't seeing it on my website, Mm -hmm. right? But once I started putting it in front of them, I booked clients so much faster. And it is 100% because of your tip, so. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) I love that. That's so great. Not everybody incorporates the lessons. So that's really wonderful to hear. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like when you dish out something so clear the way that you do, and again, that's why I'm so happy to have you here. Michelle just talks plain. She just tells you like it is. She's not going to be like trying to impress you with fancy words. She's going to just tell you exactly the (laughs) truth and how to, how to strategize these things. Um, so anyway, yeah, I just wanted to make sure you got credit for really changing my booking rate. I mean, genuinely, I know that people booked me um, faster because of that change. So yeah, they understood who you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, you know, it it made me think about why am I doing this, mm-hmm. and made even just the fact that I was doing it more clear and more genuine. You know, so yeah. Yes, big props to you for that. Um, (laughs) That's not what we're talking about today. Today, we are talking about your questions on your finances. Your questions, mostly the ones that came in, I allowed you to anonymously send me questions. So you did not have to be like, here's what I'm struggling with. Um, And we got a couple of just, I think, the most important ones today. Um, We have questions on cash flow and how to handle your deposits moving forward. Mm -hmm. So... Michelle, would you like to pick where we start here? Do you want to start with the financial yeah. flow? Yeah. Let's talk about cash flow in general. I think a lot of people aren't sure what that means. Yes. Um, and it's, I mean, it's like every profession, right? We talk to people as if they know what we're talking about. So so with, with your clients, a lot of times we start talking about flowers and all these things. And our clients may not know the difference between a rose and a dahlia and a blah, blah, right? I'm one of those people, I'm a black thumb. So um, so I'm clueless when people are talking about flowers and plants to me. Um, And it's the same thing with the money side of the business. I think a lot of times we start, or I know I start talking about, you know, financial strategy and financial planning. And um, I try to bring it down to the most, you know, the simplest uh, ideas because not everybody's talking my language all the time. So, yep. yeah. So cash flow is essentially the study of the way money literally moves in and out of your business. Um, and when you are doing a cash flow plan, which is really what I focus on, which has become so valuable right now that everybody's going through the crisis, um, is you're really trying to predict how your cash is going to come in and out. Um, fortunately, in our industry, we have contracts in place for you know six months, twelve months, eighteen months out. And even though right now our contracts are, are you know our events are moving, you know they're getting pushed out, they're getting postponed, they're getting canceled. We still know that we're going to have contracts versus a restaurant or a retail store that may not know what their ca- what their cash inflow, meaning the cash coming in, is going to be yep. in May, in June, right? Yeah. Well, with you know, with a floral event business, it, even if your June event got moved till September, November, December next year, you can kind of you know see those dollars moving and you know maybe rethink um the arrangements that you have with clients or rethink some of the retainers and things like that that you ask for people so with cash flow strategy um you that's what you're looking at you're you're trying to uh guess it's guessing you guys right (laughs) everybody talks about forecasting like it's the scientific thing meteorology and (laughs) astrology meteorology magic eight ball, whatever you want to call it. At the end of the day, it's guessing. But when you've been in business for a while, the guessing gets a little bit easier. So your first three years in business, your guessing is pretty hardcore guessing. Yes. Five years, your guessing gets to become a lot easier. Um, And with those contracts in place, you can say, okay, I've got these 10 clients um, that I'm definitely doing events for sometime 20 or 2020 or 2021. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that I can count on that cash coming in sometime in the next 18 months. 
during normal, you know, non-crisis times, you know exactly what month those payments are going to come in. Okay. Yeah. Right now, you know, we know that they're going to come in, if not 2020, likely 2021. Right. Yeah. So, and then the, the cash outflow, that's a little bit easier to understand. Those are your expenses. That's similar to an expense budget. So if you are somebody like me, who I, so I teach a course called flower math. I teach people how yes. to make the profit. Right. Mm -hmm. But I am not an accountant. I accounting was, let's just say my accounting teacher and I did not get along is, is the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and it was the toughest for me. So I still, I need to take one of your QuickBooks courses because I still use a very basic spreadsheet that, you know, I have all, I have everything there. My accountant is like, this works, you know, with like almost a pat yeah. on the head, but it does work. So, you know, for me, it's as basic as just the other day, I was making a lesson um, for uh, my Patreon subscribers. And one of the things I was doing was showing like how I check a client into my mm. business. And it's again, cause I don't use fancy software. Um, not that fancy software has to be fancy, but um, you know, I just do this all in a spreadsheet. So I was, because I made the lesson, I had this catalyst of making, looking at all my 2020 weddings and how they had moved to 2021. So I literally just did that the other day and seeing that. And while it was like, you know, crushing, it was all like <laughs> what you said. I can see now how much money I'm going to make in 2021. Yes. So when we do that, what do you, what do you suggest once we do that? What do you suggest we are actually looking at or paying attention to or thinking about? Yeah. So, um, Right now, we're we're kind of trying to figure out what our cash situation is going to realistically look like for 2020. And kind of, that's kind of what it's coming down to. Most of us are facing a time when we run out of cash. It kind of depends a lot on how much cash we walked into with all of this. Yeah. Um, you know, I think everybody now knows the importance of having that cash on hand, whether they've gone through this exercise or not. Yep. Everybody knows that. I wish I had more cash in the bank, right? Like everybody has that feeling, no matter how well prepared they are, they, yeah. they are going through that realization. Yeah. Um, so the cash flow planning is going to help you essentially see how long you can get by before you run out of cash. Um, under normal circumstances, we're creating that plan to, to really think about how to grow the business or scale the business or add staff or you know, expand sales or move into a, a new space or things like that, where we're looking at it for growth strategies. Right now, we're looking at it for survival strategies. Right. And so the cash flow plan being a future tool, right? It's different from a QuickBooks or an Excel spreadsheet that tracks tracks what happened in the last month. It's really a future tool. Yep. And so, um, so you're really looking at it to see what's happening. And so by lining up all your payments coming in, let's say you're, you have $20,000 of cash in the bank right now, and you're not getting another payment for three or four months, it's going to tell you how long can I get by with the 20,000 that I have in the bank right now. Yep. And so that's, that's the thing is that it really does give you control. It's, it's weird because you really, at the end of the day, you don't have the control, but you can, you can see, so you can make decisions, you can adjust. What do I need to do? I run out of cash in three months. Right. Okay, what's my game plan in you know August, September, knowing that I may not get more payments until next year? What's my game plan? Am I going to get, get, get into floral delivery? Am I going to expand into you know plants are really big right now? Um, am I going to offer some sort of subscription services? A lot of people are, you know, buying things through subscription, gifting subscriptions as well. Yep. There's a lot of gifting happening. People want to make people feel happy. Yeah. And flowers, thankfully, are really one of those wonderful ways that, that people can do that and they show are. a little love. And um, Mother's Day was just huge for florists. They had yeah. a really, really big booming holiday, which just proves what you're saying, which is that people are paying attention now. And this is the time to kind of figure out how you're going to bring that money in. Mm -hmm. So 
what I hear you saying, Michelle, is that knowledge is power. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> right? Yeah. Knowing what your dollars are doing just gives you so much more control over your business. And yeah, like you said, it can be scary to see those numbers, but wow, so much better knowing what they are, knowing what you're really looking at. I think it also helps you make decisions for some of these SBA loans. Yes. Right. And so some of us applied for EIDL and, and PPP and things like that. And so most of that has been processed already. But the SBA is now coming out with other loan packages that um, are not the forgivable loan, but a more traditional SBA product that has a pretty great interest rate. Um, but before you accept a loan for I mean, I've seen some ridiculous amounts for like one hundred thousand dollars you may not want to be on the hook for $100,000 for 30 years. Like, look at your cash situation, see what your shortfall really is under the worst case scenario, mm -hmm. and consider, you know, an SBA product at a very low interest rate to kind of make it through these next conceivably 18 months. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so that's, that's the big thing with the cash flow plan is it really kind of helps you decide, like, how am I going to get through this crisis? And yes. yeah and see like the actual numbers. Hey, maybe it's not as bad as I thought, or, oh, yeah, yeah. hey, maybe I need to do something now because I don't have until August to figure this out. Yes. Um, I've got on the screen here, you guys, you can, Michelle actually has a cash flow course that she is, it is very reasonably priced, <laughs> I am sure, for what you're gonna learn from it. Um, so if you're like, how do I do this? Or what do I, what am I going to do? I don't understand. <laughs> Go to her website and check it out because um, she really does know how to help you look at this and not be afraid of what you're seeing. It will be knowledge and power when you see, I have enough money to get through December, right? I don't have to, I don't have to pivot or change anything. I can whatever yeah. it is for you, that's going to be true. I just need to book some weddings, take a bigger deposit or whatever it is mm -hmm. so that I feel like I'm back where I belong. Yeah. Um, all right. I have a question, a few questions coming in. First of all, hi, everybody who's tuning in. Hi from the UK. Um, all right. Question for the both of you. Allison advises us to not live off our deposits. <laughs> How do you advise we assess our current financial situation of deposits versus other monies? to know what we can spend versus what we keep on hand. Uh, this is, I feel like I'm making exceptions for every rule this year, to be quite honest, because I also tell people like, don't take out a debt on a service-based business. You're ne like, it's going to be cuckoo bananas. And, and these days I'm like, you know what? An SBA loan at 3% interest over 30 years, you really ought to consider that. And yeah. there would be no other time that I would even allow my clients to do that. I have to be honest. Yeah. So I feel the same way about deposits. I'd normally say, don't live off your deposits. You can't, but right now we're really having to look at, I'm telling people in terms of their financial strategy, they need to look at 2020 and 2021 as one entire cycle. Mm. Um, like this, the next 18 months, consider it one year. Like it's yeah. one booking season and one booking slash production season, right? Yeah. Um, whereas like normally we'd split that, those into two to be quite honest. But so when you're looking at that from an, you know, now this is your selling season, the next through December, 2021, and we're using this number arbitrarily because we think or hope there may be a vaccine. We don't know, right? We don't know what the limitations are going to be, but we do think that there is going to be some reprieve in terms of gathering by some point in 2021. So consider this these next 18 months one season and so what it realistically you are likely going to have to live off of those deposits for 2020 to be quite honest um but the cash flow plan is that's where you're going to get the clarity right so when you are creating you know in the cash flow process something that i have people do is you line up your payments um to see when that cash is coming in and then you make a a sales goal too. And so that sales goal amount, maybe I'm hoping to get 10 retainers for um, in 2020. And these 10 retainers of $5,000 a pop on average, I'm going to be getting them every other, you know, every month or something like that. 
that is going to be what helps me kind of make it through the year. And then the final payments I need to see, cause then I have just final payments to make it. It's a smaller, yeah. smaller budget that I'm using and then having to pay cost of flowers and cost of labor and things like that. It's not giving you a lot of margin yeah. to work with for your operating budget and for your owner's draws and things like that in 2021. So things continue to be tight but you may need those retainers to kind of make it through. This is why you have to create that plan yes. for 18 months to really see what your retainers and your final payments actually are doing. So I mean, like, don't dry out your retainers. You're going to need some of it for, you know, but, but it could be that you're, that you're using, you know, half of that retainer in, um, in 2020 and then the remainder of it you're using in 2021 you're not going to know unless you really kind of line up your cash to see how it's all falling out yes so that is really clarifying to me to think of how it's not just like i'm looking at the number i'm looking at when it's coming in right and some people do just two payments that's oh yeah you know i don't want to say that's the traditional or the typical but that is that's usually how I do it. I do yes, a not very big deposit yeah. and then a big full payment like three weeks before the wedding. Yep. And that works well for me. Now I'm like, hmm, maybe I need to think about this. Mm -hmm. I've even had customers reach out and say, would you like another payment early? Because I know that this is a weird season. And I said no. And then I'm going, hmm, should I have said no? <laughs> Should I have taken that extra thousand yeah. dollars? So for clarity, Michelle is saying that normally she would agree <laughs> with me that you should not live off your deposits. Yes. I want to really like dive into a little bit more about why it is okay to maybe do that now, but just let, I want you to touch on why should we normally not live on deposits once we're back into whatever our new mode is going to be moving yeah, forward. Yeah, you know, you have to really figure out what your margins are. I mean, with with the floral business, it's all about margins, right? And so um, if you're living off of your, your deposit or your retainer, that second payment may be only going to pay for, you know, cost of floral and, and, uh, and labor, and you don't have any left to pay for operations and overhead and your yourself and staff and things like that. Um, so you need to really figure out, you know, if your margin, if your cost margin is, you know, 30%, you need, you know that you need to leave 30% of that at the end or 40% or 50%, whatever, whatever that is, it's different for every business. I'll tell you, you know, there's certain um, ear benchmarks that I think are good for floral businesses, but I see floral businesses operate at all sorts of different margins to be quite honest. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so yeah, so you have to know what that margin is to know really what you have left. And let's say it's a third, right? You don't want to use up that final third until, you know, the very end, cause you're not going to have anything left to buy. Right. Right. <laughs> What so yeah, from... so under normal circumstances, you have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, for now, I would I would say yes, you're allowed to use some of that retainer. Try to hold on to some of it. Um, you know, try to kind of keep in mind. You know, at, at at the very least, you can kind of have an idea of okay, I I know I'm going to have you know a hundred thousand dollars in floral costs next year to fulfill those um, ten events, and so that needs to be my, my cash savings goal at some point, right. um, or at least a good portion of it. Cause you're going to have money coming in and stuff like that next year as well. Yep. Um, but you kind of want to think about what that reserve might be that you want to have. So for people who have just had the, the, the process of living off of deposits be their norm, mm. is there any advice for how to maybe shift that mindset considering that now they're stuck, right? Because now they've spent mm -hmm. the money and oh, now right, yeah. they're really stuck because they're not going to get more payments unless they, you know, work something out with their clients. Um, just what sort of, how can they sort of dig themselves out of this if this is the way they, they've structured their business so far? Yeah, I'd say, you know, honestly, the, the only way to kind of get out of that is to like improve your pricing and like improve your margins. That's really the only way to get ahead of the cash game, to be quite honest. Yep. 
Um, and so, you know, let's say your your floral costs are forty percent, so your profit margin is about sixty percent. Try to beat that that margin by two percentage points if you can. Even just I try like, to encourage them to go for seventy percent on yeah. the cost of flowers and supplies. Right. Like that to me that. is an ideal too. Yes. Yeah. 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 So like if your goal is 70% uh, profit margin on the cost of flowers and supplies, your labor, all your other overhead comes out of that. That's when you're making the, the, the highest margin yeah. that you can at least 70% on those. And things. that's what I tend to see the healthier floral businesses are operating. Yeah. I mean, every now and then I see a 75%. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. But um, around 70% is what I tend to see a pretty healthy floral business. And then I tend to see, and this really kind of depends on where people are in the country, but somewhere around 10% for labor. Mm -hmm. Some people, it could be a lot lower if you don't have tons of staff, or it could be 15% if you live in New York City, right? Like it really kind of depends, but I'd say around 10% is what I tend to see just floral labor. This is not yep. like staff, office managers, and things like that. Gotcha. Um, so That's you put those two things together now. and you've got, you know, 40% costs just, just to produce events, you know, 60% yep. margin for a uh, profit margin. Yep. Um, so I want to go back to, you said it is okay for us to <laughs> dip into those deposits a little bit now going forward. We want to make sure we have cash on hand for when we do need to make our purchases in 2021. Um, I've got another one coming in here from Alyssa from Florology. Um, how would you advise any of us florists who had planned for a large scale growth? Mm -hmm. We're a home studio, but we were going to make the jump um, to retail this year. We're expecting our margins to increase with the increased growth of a shop, but currently finding a lot of security with having a home studio given light of everything. Um, so for people who were thinking about growing and maybe what should they think now? <laughs> yeah. So I would say most people that I've been working with for several years, we had a lot of forecasted growth for this year. And I think that that was based on a boom. But I, I do have to say we, we have been kind of approaching a recession for a few years. So it's just that it's, it's kind of happened overnight, um, unfortunately. So, you know, I, I still feel like that plan for growth, it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen this year, clearly. I mean, this is not a growth year. And and quite honestly, 2021 is not a growth year either. Right. Um, so don't put that plan, you know, completely away. You just know that you have probably have to plan it for 2022, 2023, realistically. Um, 2020 and 2021 are maintenance years. And so like, like survival years and and that's that yeah. and survival can mean that we're going to have to do a lot of crazy things that we didn't want to do or we haven't done in several years and we wouldn't normally consider doing um i'm telling people like don't discount what you do don't you know if you normally um you know price you know big events at ten thousand plus continue that structure, continue to meet that target market of that high end. Yeah. Um, you may need an entry level service to offer to people because of the economy. So let's say that normally you're working at $10,000 price plus um, floral budgets. You may need to introduce a $3,000 one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just to have that entry level product, especially because we're, we may not be able to see big scale events for a couple years. Um, but don't like, don't let go of the fact that you are working with a, a normally with a affluent market or with a market priced over here. Um, because if you let go of that, it's going to take way too long for you to, to reteach the market, um, and to find that target market again. Yeah. And I'm saying this from experience, having had a small business in the last recession, like don't abandon your market. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, I really love the way you put that, having to reteach your market. Like it's a, that's, it's really, so hard to do. it is. Um, I was listening, I've been tuning into Sam Jacobson's um, weekly uh, podcast or really long webinars is what they are. <laughs> really long. And I can't, 
stop listening to them because they're really good. But last week he was talking about the difference between like a temporary solution for yeah. a temporary yeah. problem, a permanent solution yeah. for a temporary problem. And it just really, it helps you realize, um, you know, we could be in a place for those of us who are like action takers, you know, you're yeah. like, I must act now, right? Like I have a small wedding package on my website already. You know, it's like, this is what we're doing. I haven't yep. sold it yet, right? But this yep. is what it's going to be. But you don't want to necessarily act so fast, you know, that you're going to have to reteach your market who you are. Really like the way that you put that. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really like that. Yeah. Um, and let's see, I got a couple comments here. Rashida said, I am so here for this. I haven't taken a loan myself. Um, We've got people tuning in in Canada, in Ohio, in the UK. Let's see. Um, we were noting that there could be opportunities created in this chaos. Thank you for sharing for experience and expertise. Excellent. Um, there are opportunities. Oh, in there this. are. That's the thing is like once you kind of get through, uh, you know, I was talking with a group the other day talking about like the change cycle, it's similar to like the stages of grief. And I think once we get through, most of us kind of had the initial shock and then doubts and like, what the hell is going on? And then the bottom of the pit, the, I call it the valley of despair, where like many of us have experienced like a deep depression trying to like figure out what's going to happen with our industry and businesses and just having kids at home and things like that. Once you kind of get out of that valley of despair is when you can start to like see changes happen for the good. Yeah. And um, I think there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, in the last recession, this is where we started to see Okay, Etsy was just a fledgling little website with some little artisans on it in 2006, 2007. And then we get the, um, you know, the recession and everyone's like, I'm going to make crafts and I'm going to sell crafts and I need to make money. So I'm going to put my stuff on Etsy. And I mean, and look at, look at us now, like so much of the gig economy came out of the last recession. Yeah. So people needing to like pick side hustles and um you know and then the sharing economy came out of the last recession as well so there is a lot of like incredible opportunity that i feel like we're just at the forefront and i feel like once we get out of that period of like where we're feeling the despair of the losses of what we've gone through where we really can start to say like okay well how can i like change my my business and where, how can I make money in new creative ways? And that can actually be very exciting to be quite honest. Yes. Yes. And it is, you're, you're hitting it on the head where it's these different phases where like one week it's this, the next week it's this, the next week, oh, we must do this. Oh, but wait, maybe not. It's, there isn't one path forward. And also, you know, particularly, I mean, we have people watching from all over the place, but in the United States, each state has a different thing that you're allowed to do or oh, yeah. not do. So yeah. there yeah. isn't one path forward for people right now um, in terms of knowing like when you're going to get back or if you can do a wedding or whatever in your area. Um, mm -hmm. So you you touched on it. We She knows where I'm going with this. We both, we've talked about this a little bit. Like should we, shouldn't we talk about oh. what should you do you need a side hustle right now, right? Once you do Michelle's cash flow plan, right? Like once you actually head over to her website and get her cash flow plan, once you see your numbers, once you know, you can make an informed decision from there. Do I need more money and how do I make that happen? So I'll let you share maybe some of your insights about like when, when do we know it's time to branch out outside yeah. of an entrepreneurial thing and get a gig. Honestly, I this is this is the real talk that I think needs to happen in this industry that is not always happening is that there is no shame in getting outside work outside of our businesses. And it doesn't mean that our business has to go anywhere. It doesn't mean that we're not still living to make our business happen. But the reality is that we could be facing this limitation in events for the next year and a half. And if your business relies on corporate, I mean, if, if then forget about it. Right. Um, and so I think that's a really important part of this conversation that we need to be having is if, 
introducing additional services is not very realistic for your business and it's not going to produce enough income to make up for the income that's lost. And there's no shame in getting a part-time job, doing something else, looking for side gigs, um, you know, putting stuff up on Upwork and fancy hands and things like that, trying to find additional income. Right now you have to do what you have to do to survive. And that could mean that you're taking a side job. Listen, I've been an entrepreneur for 15 years and I've had plenty of side jobs and yeah. <laughs> different, you know, ups and downs, peaks and valleys. I've had to do all sorts of crazy things. And that's just part of, you know, you know, having, you know, creative careers and, and things like that and creative businesses. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you have to do that, go for it. I give you full permission to do what you have to do to make it through the next two years. Cause yeah. this is not, this is not easy. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And it's not a time to be like prideful where you're like, but I have done this, you know, for me, I'm 18 years yeah. into having my business. Mm -hmm. It is unfathomable <laughs> that this is happening, even as it's happening, even if, yeah. as I have two people right now that I have to reply to, to be like, yep, we're moving that. And yep, we'll do, you know, a small wedding this year and a big thing in 2022. That's what they're planning. Yep. And I have an October one. She's like, you know what? We will scale this on back now, right? In <laughs> October. And yeah. then we're going to raise the roof in 2022. Yep. Yep. Already. Yep. 2022, right? And that's because, and we've been talking about this, right? Like the wedding pros who are hosting webinars, attending webinars, that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. 2022 being when you can start feeling a little more certain. And, you know, because you mentioned vaccine, right? We do keep referring to that, right? It's like, well, when we have a vaccine, except that I really did hear something the other day. They're like, we've never had a vaccine for like a, some, for like a sneeze, for something you can sneeze on somebody, right? <laughs> this may not even be something we get a vaccine for if we're just being for real. We may yeah. have therapeutics, right? So something that can- A treatment, treat. yeah, yeah. But we, even in that regard, you know, we just might not get that. It's like- yeah. Do we have a vaccine for a cold? We don't. No. Right? Yeah. We, don't have a, we don't actually have that. So yes. um, it's important to be super real with yourself instead of going, well, here's what I've got in 2021. Here's what we think and we hope we have going on in 2021. And some of those people may still need to be scaled back from what they are thinking right now. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And they, they don't know it yet, but yeah. we should know it so that. Well, and yeah. also, you know, I know a lot of people are kind of positioning their business for smaller events and things like that. But the reality is smaller events, um, you know, regardless of the work that's put into them, have a perception of being a lower price point. And I say that because sometimes smaller events can be just as costly or the expectation can be just as high. Yes. But but the um, you know the consumer um, perception is that it should be lower priced. Um, and so with floral, there's a cost input and typically like a price associated with that. Other segment services, a planner, a lot of times she could be putting in, um, you know, the same amount of work for a 30 person event than a 300 person event, right? So there's certain segments and with floral, it really kind of depends on how elaborate your client wants. Yeah. Regardless of that, the perception is a smaller event, an intimate dinner for 30 people should have a sm smaller price point. So what does that mean for, you know, for, for you who product service based business, it's going to mean a ton more volume. So in order to make up, you know, the the loss of that ten thousand dollar wedding, you may have to be doing three, you know, three small three thousand dollar weddings on a Saturday or every weekend instead. Um, that volume based business is is operationally incredibly challenging for for floral business, and so you're moving from you know where the model of a service based business like ours, which is so labor intensive, the model typically tends to be that after a certain point in your experience history, you move towards doing larger budgets, fewer of them a year. So let's call it the, you know, the 30 events, $10,000 plus budgets, right? Just to use approximations. Well, right now we're having to flip our business models upside down to do like 
a hundred events at three thousand dollars that's an entirely different business model than the ones that we've created in our business so when you're going through the numbers you may realize like doing that doesn't make me any money and right. if that's the case that's where you really need to kind of think like all right well I don't know if I want to be doing high volume, low price point. I may need another strategy to kind of make it through the next two years. And that may mean a part time job of 15, 20 right. hours a week to like bridge the gap of the $20,000 that my cash flow is short or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, and again, you know, this just it all being so real and connected. If you do the cash flow plan and you see where you're at and you have a sense, and you know that you don't want to create a permanent solution to a temporary problem yeah. where now you have, you know, you have to, you know, reteach your market, right? What you're doing now, because you're, you're like, oh, we're doing a hundred events. Um, mm -hmm. And you really do want to get back to doing 30 or if you're like me, 12, right? Like I want to do exactly. yeah. 12, like reasonable events. Yes. Next year, my calendar is almost fully booked. I've got double booked weekends and I just have to like suck it up because yep. I'm rebooking people. And so two of them are landing on July 17th and OK. And two of them are on the 31st and OK. And July is going to be thumbs down for me next year based on the way I set my business up all these years. Yep. So that I can just take the work I want. Right. So yeah. different different. But if I don't want to do the double bookings, if I want to, if I don't want to do the small weddings, then I have to do something else. Like, what's it going to be? Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's just the way it's going to be. Yeah. Um, so, all right. I have another question coming in here. Hi, Allison and Michelle. Any advice for a new studio florist? I'll be official September time, if not before. So I'm going to keep my part-time nursing role until my business is making money. I think that's exactly what you want to do is keep that job until it's making money. Yes. Yes. I would say um, keep that job until it's making money. I would say that you want to have in business savings um, at least a third of the income you'd like to have from mm -hmm. your business. So let's say that you're trying to, you know, uh, you'd like to pay yourself a hundred thousand dollars just to work with, with broad numbers. I would be aiming to save about, you know, 30, $35,000, um, to kind of bridge the gap of that first year that you're not able to kind of make the immediate income. Cause it takes at least a couple years to kind of get to those earnings goals. If you're really strategic with your your financial strategy. Yeah. Um, and if people don't have a financial strategy, it can take five to 10 years to get there. Um, That's what I think, think. I think, I think that is worth repeating. So yeah. if you don't have a strategy, it's going to take you, did you hear that? Like twice or three times yeah. longer, right? Yeah. Yeah. We got to know where we want to go if we're going to get there. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I mean, look, I have, I don't want to say I've been lucky in business because I have worked way too hard to <laughs> call it luck. Right. Yeah, but totally. I have been fortunate that I knew that I had to start small, that I knew that I had to work other businesses at, at other jobs at first so that I could have my part-time passion of growing my business. Right. And eventually I was able to, not work for anybody else, but it mm -hmm. took time. It wasn't like I wasn't brave enough. And that is, yeah. it was not brave enough to be like, I am not going to have any guaranteed income this year and I'm going to start my business. That was not me. I'm not that entrepreneur. I'm the like, let me build slow and steady. So even though I didn't have a plan, I guess that's where I'm coming up with the luck piece. I didn't have a plan, but I was motivated and I knew enough what to do to get to where I was going. But you should have a plan if you want to get to where you're going. Otherwise, you're just like, you're, you're like, I, I have my GPS. Where am I going? Well, what's your destination? I don't know. <laughs> but tell me how to get there. You know? Yeah. yeah. I really, really like that rule of thumb. So like a third of the income that you hope to make in your business, have that in savings so yeah. that you don't feel as much pressure. I yeah. really, really like that. Yeah. That's huge. That's a huge tip. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see, Phoebe says, brilliant ladies, thanks Phoebe. Um, all right, I've got a financial plan in my head, but no written strategy per se. What are some elements to a financial strategy so we can work on putting that into place? I think that getting your cash flow plan, right? Like, so again, you can head right over to stageweddingpros.com and you'll see all, she's got a bunch of online courses and she's got like, I know people have questions on um, QuickBooks and stuff like that. She's got all the stuff. She knows all this stuff. Um, <laughs> I did tell one of our Australian florists who is probably sleeping now, um, <laughs> that's the question that is completely unrelated to this. However, it is on QuickBooks. And I was like, I'll throw it out at Michelle. She's wondering, and maybe this is something to, to type or something, but um, how does she like export the names, the email addresses of her people who have live invoices right now? So you don't necessarily have to answer that right oh, now. Oh yeah, here. huh. <laughs> well, there's probably, if you can go to like, um, yeah, you can email me and I can explain that to you. <laughs> there is an export option within your like open open invoices listing and there's probably a, an export option for sure. She's like looking for how does she get those those um, addresses out there? Yeah. Um, so I'll let her know that you you probably have an answer for that. But uh, But yeah, from everything from like, you know, the the cash flow standpoint, I know when you not knowing is the worst part and it's the, the place where florists are most comfortable, right? Because yeah. I'll say like, hey, what was your profit margin on this wedding? And people will go, well, I haven't figured that out yet. Like, I want to know before I deliver the wedding what I made on this thing. Yeah. It, it helps motivate me, frankly, because when I'm like, oh, I made a 78% profit margin on this. I am not in a rush. I can stay around for another half hour to pin those boutonnieres. Mm -hmm. You know, it, mm -hmm. it makes you, you don't feel that like, I don't know, I'm just doing my job and getting out of here. You feel that like, I got my money. <laughs> and yeah. Now I'm yeah. Well, and I think with floral, one of the biggest risks that I always see is, you know, gifting your clients, you know, they didn't come with a big enough budget and you want to make it look nice. And so you end up buying to make up what they didn't want to pay you. Um, and so that's where I see a lot of florists leaving money on the table. And, and really, you're only going to know that if you start um, tracking, you know, margins and things like that. And the other thing I see is like the um, the stress purchasing is like during busy season when it's so crazy and you don't really have time to think about like maybe you made your recipes maybe and um but then when it comes down to purchasing you're like oh i don't know i'm too busy to think about it i, I put this but i'm nervous and i have to, i don't have time to revisit it i'm just going to order like extra 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 and then there goes your margins right yep. so those Every are the two big things that i see people blowing their margins yeah so yeah so the first thing i would say is like you have to know your margins and that's probably where allison um you know, class for pricing can be really helpful for that. And then once you know those margins, it's going to help you put together a really stronger um, financial strategy. Um, something I wanted to share is that if people want a free cash flow plan, they can text three three um, Sage dollar sign to three three seven seven seven, and they'll get an email with the free cash flow cash flow plan. Oh, that's really nice. Here, wait, let me yeah. type that out again. What is it? Um, it's Sage dollar sign. And if they text it to three, three, seven, seven, seven. All right. That up on the That'll kind of start them out on. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Cause these are things that are very easy to hide from. And I, like I said, I don't like to call myself lucky because I work too hard, but I've been lucky that I have always made a profit because I always knew how to price based on what I learned in flower shops. Mm -hmm. So I never questioned. I don't overfill. I mean, especially when I was younger, I mean, I would throw a flower away before I would give it to you for free. Um, <laughs> a little bit more, I swear to God, I'm a little more generous now, but you know, overfilling is a problem, right? It sets the wrong expectation. Totally. And every time you do it, you're losing money. Yes. So 
it's it's not a gift. Nobody nobody's given me a gift. You know, I don't go places and people are like, here's something extra. Here's something extra. It just doesn't happen. I wish it did. You know, I wish it did, but it doesn't. So we can't be in that in that habit either. Um, but when you actually so I was lucky that I always made money, but I didn't look at how much I made per event frankly, until sort of fairly recently, like I'd say seven years, like I, I was a full on decade plus into my business before I was tracking that. I was just, but the margins is everything. If you were really strategic with your margins, that's, that's everything, you know, in the 10 years that I've been working with floral business owners, if you know your margins and you have a really strong benchmark and a high profit margin, that's that's everything. It's not even so much about ex overhead expenses and things like that. And it's it's all in that pricing and those margins. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And it's very important to recognize the the fact that this is empowering, right? It is not to find out that your margins are sixty oh, yeah. percent, you know, instead of seventy. You go, okay, now I know what I have to do. Totally. If you take the time to actually go, okay, I'm gonna get her cash flow plan. I'm going to get in on this course, get in on it. And then you'll see, okay, I actually, I'm breathing easier because I actually can make it to January or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so it's very important not to hide from these things. And I say this as the person who's always in here going, you got to track your, you know, I also didn't do this for a really long time. So it's, you know, there's no shame in your game. If there's you're no not. judgment in it. It's just, yes. honestly, it's really to become a stronger decision maker at the end of the day. So like I always tell people, like, you know, if you compare your cash, the plan to the actual, if you don't hit your targets, it's not a big deal. Like nobody ever gets it a hundred percent. Some months you're higher, some months you're lower. That's just how it is but it's really to be a point of reflection so that you can make stronger decisions down the road. So it's like, oh man, I didn't budget for this. I should have budgeted for this. Well, it's not to beat yourself up about it. It's just, it's to be able to say, oh, this is something I need to add to my plan going forward. And that's how you become so much better about creating the forecast. What we said in the beginning where it's just guessing, you get stronger at guessing when you're kind of going back and you're seeing you know, where you missed the mark and you adjust the plan accordingly. That's right, because yeah. we can make informed decisions, mm -hmm. but first we have to look at the information. Yes, yeah. We can hide from the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I've got one more coming in here. How can we be solid in our profit margins we are, when we are unsure about the wholesale pricing we receive if we are charged drastically higher prices for our flowers in the future? Oh, this is such an issue right now for floral businesses. Yeah. What are you hearing people say about that? Well, I am hearing people, um, you know, consider the tagging on a 10% increase on prices, especially after a certain date for 2021. So the, the really difficult thing is like, we don't want to be, um, you know, penalizing our clients for a pandemic, right? And so there's a balance of, like they shouldn't have to necessarily pay for a pandemic. We as consumers don't want to be paying for a pandemic either, right? And so we do have to be um, sensitive to that. But I think we can, you know, create parameters, right? And so what I'm seeing some people do that I think is working is, um, you know, if you postpone your event for a, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Sunday in 2021, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue with the same pricing structure. If you want a Saturday after March 30th in 2021, we're going to um, attach our 2021 pricing. We increase our prices every year by 15%. And, you know, because we're moving into the next year, we have to assume our 2021 pricing, which would be 15% extra. But again, we're willing to waive that if you're getting married on Thursday or Friday, right? Like you can make exceptions because you want to work with people and, be accommodating or appear accommodating at least. Um, but with floral, this is going to be a really big challenge. So I would be thinking of incorporating something to that effect. And yeah. then, you know, something we talked about earlier is trying to see if you can split up those payments. So if you have that 50% that you were going to get at the end, see if they'll split up that last payment in, you know, 30 or half of it now and half of it at the end. 
just to steady out your cash flow a little bit more. Yeah. You know, for where I sit, because I haven't had to buy any flowers, so mm -hmm. I don't know <laughs> yeah. what the cost right now. I've, from what I'm hearing, some people are saying, yes, they paid higher prices and some people are not seeing a big change just yet. Yeah. So I've been asked, like, so what are what are you going to do? I I am not I don't I think Michelle might yell at me if I say this out loud, but I don't actually raise my prices every year. Yeah, it there's no right or wrong. Like I, there's no hard and fast rules on that. It depends. You know, yeah. sometimes um, I just sort of raise a minimum for what my centerpieces will be this year. So yeah. I'm not quoting $75 centerpieces. I'm quoting 95 minimums, yeah. you know, stuff like that. But I don't necessarily have a set way that I, that I, I don't want to say jack up the prices because that sounds like it's unnecessary. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there isn't a certain way where I increase it. Um, however, I think the way that I think when I do my pricing is I don't think about what I bought something for, I think about what I sell it for. So yeah. Michelle mentioned my favorite word, recipes, you need recipes. So when I make my recipes, I don't say, well, I paid a dollar for that rose. I think, am I charging $4 for this or $5 yep. for this? So when I think in retail dollars, I'm thinking I've already marked it up, right? Yep. Yep. So if there's a small difference, it doesn't really impact my bottom line because I'm not I'm not so close. I don't have a spending goal, you know. Yeah, I don't yeah. go to my wholesaler saying I have to spend thirty percent. Yeah, that's why sometimes I make a seventy eight percent profit margin, right? Because I didn't tell myself some artificial rule totally. that I owe a certain spend to my customer, right? Mm -hmm. That's they didn't sign up for me because they said so. Now you're going to spend a certain amount of this, right? Yeah, it's what it looks like. Yeah, what the, the value whole of deal. Yeah. It's yeah. the whole deal. Totally. Um, so I think that it's going to be some people are going to just build in that buffer. Some mm -hmm. people are going to wait and see. I'm a little bit of a wait and see. Like I'm I would rather. Too. Yeah, you are. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. I'm yeah. But like I want to see what are the prices so that I can say to my customer. So listen, roses cost this much now and this mm -hmm. cost extra now and this is obviously something that you know i didn't know right they know i didn't know this they know mm -hmm. i'm not like coming at them all shady i didn't know this when you booked me for your wedding last year yeah and so now there's a difference and then i can maybe present it in a way that feels totally. palatable to them yes well and i think that it's all about the communication and the relationship right like to have a very open and honest conversation about like listen I had no idea that we were going to be facing this, but our pricing has gone up 20%. Can we split the difference? Or, you know, you can have, you can have those open conversations. There's no right or wrong approach. Um, I think it really just kind of depends on the relationship that you've built with your client and what they've come to expect, yeah. whether, whether you're wait and see, or whether you kind of have that policy in place now for any of any Saturday event after March 30th is we're, um, you know, associating our 20 or a 10% pricing that we have every year. There's no right or wrong way. I think it's helpful to think about it now so that you are prepared with a plan, at least in your mind. Yeah. Um, well, cause you bring up a good point. Like we don't necessarily want to say, so the price is going to be up 10% if it's really going to be up 20. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. Yeah. All right. I am going to just say, I want to wrap it here because I've been on so many super long webinars lately, <laughs> like I said, that have been great. But I think this is just like you hit on all the things that I think are most important on people's minds right now. And I really can't thank you enough for doing this with us today. Um, you are an absolute wealth of knowledge. And um, because I attended one of Michelle's conferences, I'm in her alumni group. So I've been seeing her, you know, just drop in knowledge and sharing only the most important things. You know, she doesn't like spam us with like, oh, here's just a <laughs> random article. You know, she's like, here's something to be thinking about. So I feel like I have been more informed this whole, the whole dang pandemic because <laughs> you. So thank you. From my personal experience, you have made this a lot easier. So oh, I appreciate it. Oh, good. That. I'm so glad. Well, thank you for having me. This is so fun. Your your community asked some really great questions. I love it. They're a really amazing community. You would be yeah. surprised at how many florists are in here and everyone really 
um, acts with such integrity and uh, kindness. It's quite a, it's quite a thing. That's so fantastic. I'm very, very, very pleased with it. And again, I thank you so, so much. You guys head over to Sage Wedding Pros, get the cash flow plan. Stop. Don't be stupid. Just get it. Okay? <laughs> and, um, and don't forget, you can text to get some free info from her to get your cash flow plan going. Okay. All right. Um, Thanks, Allison. So we will bid you adieu. And um, seriously, Michelle, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, and keep everybody. Doing everybody. I'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.